I've always believed that where you come from shapes who you become, and my story began long before I was even born. Back in the late 70s, my parents left West Germany, looking for a better shot at life. They made the big move to Canada with hopes of a fresh start, and my mom was pregnant with me when they landed in Montreal. My dad, a skilled goldsmith, landed a job quickly, and they started piecing together a future, not just for themselves, but for the family they were about to grow. I grew up hearing stories of their sacrifices. My dad's hard work paid off, and by the time my brother Michael came along, he'd opened his own jewelry shop in the West End, proving just how hard he'd worked we had a good life in Beaconsfield, but it was clear their journey wasn't without its struggles. I'm Jacob Feltz, but everyone calls me Jake. My parents left West Germany in 1979, before the wall came down, and settled in Montreal, where I was born dad got to work as a goldsmith and a few years later Michael was born. Things really took off when dad opened his jewelry store, giving us a comfortable life. These days, they spend their winters in Florida I was just an average student, more into girls and hockey than my classes. Finding a job in French-speaking Quebec was tough with my so-so French. Eventually, I landed a gig in customer service at a Vancouver-based building materials company a year later. I moved to Vancouver, where my French skills surprisingly helped me get the job. I fell head over heels for the city, the modern vibe, the beaches, and the mountains. I made friends through work and hockey. I joined a beer league and ended up as a first-line defenseman because I could skate backward. It was a blast and kept me in shape. At the end of the season, I met Judy Hansen at a teen barbecue. She was from Montreal, too. We hit it off, exchanged numbers, and started dating. Judy was stunning, with short dark brown hair and a slim figure within a year, I popped the question, and after some talks about our future, she said yes. We'd been physically close for months, and while Judy had her conventional side, we were both happy with how things were. Judy worked as a lab technician, running medical tests for private clinics across the province. She was proud of her hard-earned job and liked the work and her mostly female colleagues, except for their boss, Bob Turnbull. When we mapped out our future, we figured that if I got the sales job, our combined income would hit around $90,000, and enough to buy a house in the crazy market. Judy agreed to marry me on the condition I secured the job, and a few months later, I did we set a wedding date and told our families. My parents were over the moon, but Judy's parents were a bit wary. Eventually they agreed to come to the wedding. We tied the knot in a small suburban church and took a quick honeymoon in Victoria and Seattle before heading back to our rented apartment I busted my ass in the new sales role, hitting my targets, while Judy kept at her lab job with its more predictable hours. Despite our different schedules, life was smooth. We saved up enough to buy a townhouse in the suburbs and celebrated our third anniversary right after moving in. We talked about starting a family, but Judy wanted to wait until we were more financially secure, though she never said when that would be like many marriages, our sex life slowed down. Before we were married we were close four or five times a week, but after three years it dropped to once or twice a week. I eventually brought it up with Judy, but she got defensive saying work was wearing us out I missed our earlier frequency, but I adapted to the new pace, understanding that not all couples want the same things at the same time. Overall, we seemed happy and on track. It's a bit surprising, but I developed a close friendship with Cindy Willows after she and her husband, Al, moved in next door. We were best friends, but there was no romantic or sexual tension between us. Cindy was a stay-at-home mom with two kids in elementary school while Al worked as a car salesman. She had a sharp wit, a no-nonsense attitude, and a bold sense of humor Cindy, a bit taller than Judy with reddish blonde hair and blue eyes, often joked about how Al did the honorable thing by marrying her after she got pregnant. They had two kids, Annabeth, a 10-year-old in fifth grade, and Bradley, a 7-year-old in second grade. Cindy sometimes called her husband Alvin when she was annoyed, but most people knew him as Al. He was about six feet tall, with curly red hair, a ruddy complexion and a flashy style, bright suits, a Rolex knockoff, and a gold ring. Al seemed to think this was the ideal car salesman look, and his always-on upbeat personality could be either charming or grating. Unfortunately, I found him more annoying 
though Judy was indifferent toward him. I really liked Cindy's straightforwardness, and over time, we became good friends. I also took a shine to her kids. Annie, or Annie as everyone called her, was polite and charming, definitely destined to be a heartbreaker. Brad was playful, always cheerful, and had manners that I appreciated. Judy, however, kept her distance from them, which made me wonder if she was signaling a reluctance to have kids. If we were ever going to start a family, I hoped ours would be like Annie and Brad, but last spring, things took a turn for the worse. After six years of marriage and almost saving up enough for a house, I got blindsided when my company was sold and the branch shut down. The news hit me hard, and Judy's reaction was one of anger and disappointment, like I had let her down it was a brutal blow to my morale. I dove into job hunting immediately, but opportunities in my field were slim. Judy would leave for work with a quick kiss, while I spent my days searching for jobs and sinking deeper into discouragement after two frustrating weeks. I was feeling pretty low when Cindy showed up one morning. Hey, handsome, got any more coffee? She asked with her usual playful spirit. She often called me handsome, even in front of Al and Judy, and they didn't seem to mind I invited her in, and as we talked I mentioned losing my job. Cindy, true to her blunt style, acknowledged how tough it was but immediately started thinking of ways to help. Unlike Judy, who seemed distant, Cindy was genuinely concerned. She asked about my best subject in school, and I told her it was English, especially writing. Cindy then mentioned a friend who worked from home writing manuals and was turning down business because of high demand. She suggested I reach out to her friend about potential opportunities. Great, thank you, Cindy, I said, really appreciating her willingness to help. Her friend's name was Paula Woods, and when Cindy handed me the phone, I caught Paula at a perfect time. I offered to call back later, but she was on a break and happy to chat, since I was a friend of Cindy's, Paula shared that she had been in a similar situation, unemployed and in need of work, when she found an ad for a job writing manuals and instructions for an import-export business. The company needed someone to create clear English instructions for products from China, as the translations they were receiving were comically bad. Paula took the job and never looked back. They're also looking for someone who can translate into French, Paula said. They've been using an expensive translation service, but they need someone in-house who can both write and translate. It's especially tough with the machinery manuals. She gave me the agency's name and her contact details, and I asked if I could mention her name she agreed, and I handed the phone back to Cindy while I poured us both more coffee. Cindy, you and Paula might have just saved my life. I can't thank you enough, I said. No need, she replied. It was nice to see you perk up again. You looked pretty down earlier. Well, Judy hasn't really grasped our situation yet. She's not thrilled about me being out of work. It's really messed up our plans. Jake, you didn't get fired. This happens to people all the time. It's just how things are now. Al's come home down before too, but I give him a pep talk and, well, a little fun and he's back next day, she laughed. Sounds like a good strategy, I said feeling envious of Cindy's ability to handle things so positively when Judy was so negative. I called the number Paula gave me and spoke with Mr. Lewis. I mentioned Paula's name and offered to provide a free sample of my work he was interested and asked if I could meet him that afternoon. We set an appointment for 2 p.m., and I was so relieved that I hugged Cindy nearly in tears. You don't know how good this feels, Cindy, Glad to help, she replied with a grin Cindy left around eleven, and I quickly showered, shaved, and put on a clean shirt, navy blazer, and tan slacks. I didn't change until after lunch to avoid any spills I met Mr. Lewis at 2 p.m. He was a balding man in his mid-fifties, Asian, and dressed in a rumpled suit, which made me wonder if he was looking for cheap labor. But since Paula had spoken highly of him, I gave him a chance. He explained that he imports machines from China and Thailand, ranging from plastics manufacturing to woodworking. The Chinese two English translations were so bad that even he couldn't understand them, despite reading the original Chinese. He needed clear English instructions for his customers and French translations to sell in Quebec. The high cost of translation services wasn't giving him the quality he needed especially since they didn't understand the machinery he was looking for someone who could do both. I understand your situation, let's give it a try, 
and if I can do the job, we can agree on a fair fee, sound good. I suggested. Yes, that works for me, I hope you can handle this because it would be a great help to my business and I'll make sure it's worth your while, he assured me. Why don't you give me a sample to work on, I can either do it here or take it home and return it when it's done, he smiled and said, my computer is a bit outdated, it's better if you use yours and let me know when you're finished, then we can review the results, great, show me the instructions and I'll get started. He handed me a thin folder from a stack and led me into his warehouse filled with crates and machinery. This is the machine the instructions are for. Look it over and ask if you have any questions. I compared the drawings in the manual to the actual machine. They matched, but I asked, how accurate are these drawings? Most are good, but sometimes they send old drawings with new machines, which causes issues. I can't sell machines without the correct drawings. It's bad for business. I can see that. These seem accurate, so I'll start on the instructions. If I hit any snags, I'll call. This first job was a trial run to see if I could handle the work and if it was a good fit for me. Mr. Lewis seemed to like my approach. I left feeling excited about this new opportunity. It wasn't exactly related to my old job, but it seemed a lot more interesting. If it worked out, I was sure I'd be happier. Judy, on the other hand, wasn't as optimistic. What do you know about machinery? How are you going to make money from this? She questioned. I know someone who's already doing this successfully and working from home, which is what I'd like to do, I replied. Oh, great. So you're going to sit around all day while I work hard in the lab. Why do you think that working from home would save us money on commuting costs? It seems like a good situation. Show me you can actually earn a living. Jake, I have my doubts. If it were that easy, everyone would be doing it, remember? I have a mechanical mind and writing skills plus I'm bilingual. That's rare here. I think I have it. Go, shot, but I need to. I, how much is this guy hang you? She asked. Nothing yet. It's a free trial to prove I can do the job. Once I know what my time is worth, I'll set a price. Great, you're working for nothing on a job you don't even know if you can do. Fantastic, she said, and stomped off to the kitchen. Her reaction dampened my enthusiasm, but I was determined to prove myself. After dinner, I went straight to our home office and started working on the instructions. The English version was so poorly translated, it was almost impossible to understand. I took a deep breath and began rewriting. By midnight, after pushing through a headache and a stiff neck, I had finished a page and a half of the six-page instructions. It was slow going, but I was finding my rhythm. Exhausted, I headed to bed, took a couple of Tylenol, and quickly fell asleep, satisfied with my effort when I woke up. Judy was already dressed and having her usual yogurt and granola breakfast. As expected, there was no coffee since she doesn't drink it. I greeted her, and she mumbled something in return. After a quick peck on the cheek, she left for work at 7. 10 a.m. I went to our office, reviewed last night's work, fixed a few small errors, and continued where I left off. I was on my second or third cup of coffee when I heard Cindy's familiar voice. Hey, it's me again, handsome, she called from the back door with a smile in her voice. Come on in, Cindy, grab a coffee. I'm in my office, I replied she entered, taking a sarcastic jab at my appearance. I was still in my t-shirt and boxers. Just because I haven't shaved her dress doesn't mean I'm a slob, I joked back. Cindy laughed and asked. What are you working on? Page three of sex, I replied with exaggerated seriousness. Translating instructions for the Heavenly Blossom Model 356K14 Thickness Planer, Cindy burst out laughing. Where do they come up with these goofy names? I have no idea, but this is tougher than I thought. I spent five hours last night just getting through a page and a half. It's going faster now, though. I should finish by noon and then start on the French. And you're doing this for free, she asked, sounding a bit like Judy. Yeah, Judy wasn't impressed either, but it's the results that will matter. I'll know soon if this is worth pursuing. Good luck, Jake. I believe you're going to surprise Judy, Cindy said, always direct and supportive. After a brief silence, Cindy asked, Jake, can I ask you something personal? Sure, go ahead. Do you think you and Judy are really happy? I paused, staring at my coffee. It's a good question, Cindy, a damn good one. I left it at that by 11, 30 am. I finished the English version and called Mr. Lewis to let him know I'd have the French done by the afternoon. He was pleased and told me to come by any time. 
That boosted my confidence. After a quick lunch and some help from my dictionary, I finished the French version by 2.30 p.m. I double-checked both versions and found no errors I dressed in business clothes and headed to Mr. Lewis' office. He reviewed my English version, occasionally nodding and making minor notes. Finally, he looked up. Excellent, Mr. Jake, I'll send your versions for verification. If your French checks out, we have a deal. He then asked how many hours I spent on the work. When I told him 11, he said, I'll have a check for $660 and ready tomorrow. I reminded him that this was supposed to be a free trial, but he insisted, I don't take advantage of good work, I believe we can do good business together. He also advised me to incorporate my business to avoid future tax issues and protect myself from liability. I thanked him sincerely and asked him to let me know if there were any problems with the French version. As I was about to leave, he surprised me by asking, don't you want your next assignment? Of course, I stammered. Eager to continue, he smiled and said, I'm confident your French version will be as good as your English, thanks to Miss Paula for introducing you. He handed me another manual, and we reviewed the machine in the back after confirming the drawings were current. We shook hands, and I left with a spring in my step. At $60 in an hour, a 40-hour week would gross over $120,000 and a year. Seeing the stack of work on Mr. Lewis' desk, I felt optimistic when I told Judy, the substantial pay rate seemed to lift her mood, and she even suggested we celebrate that night. I was feeling much better about our future and eager to tell Cindy, who had sparked the idea. The next morning I started on the new manual, which was easier due to my experience in the simpler machine I finished the English version by 1 p.m. and the French before dinner, a total of eight hours. The following morning, I called Mr. Lewis, who was pleased with my work and eager for the next project. I delivered it to him later that day, Mr. Lewis, can we set up a system where I don't have to drive in every day? I could handle a week's worth of work at a time and just email the finished translations. He agreed and suggested direct deposit for payments, which I appreciated. I'd need to set up a business account first, though. We also discussed drafting a contract and I mentioned I'd consult my business advisor after reviewing five new manuals and machines. I noticed one omission but found the job straightforward. By the end of the week, I had established a new career in business, precise word services. I filed for a GST license, opened a business account, printed business cards, and designed a letterhead. Following my lawyer's advice, I drafted a letter of understanding for Mr. Lewis outlining our agreement and hourly rate. I also bought a color laser printer as a business expense by Thursday. I had completed and returned five manuals and picked up six more, reviewing the machines before leaving. I wondered how many machines Mr. Lewis had as I booked 46 hours that week, earning nearly $4,000, and with Friday's work, I would likely double that amount. I was working non-stop in my home office. Judy barely saw me, except during dinner, where our conversations were brief. Initially, she shifted from disdain to curiosity about my new job, asking questions like, how often do you get paid? I explained, I get paid per job, I'm a contractor, so I handle my own taxes and expenses. She then hinted at needing money. Can you spare $1,000 and things are tight since you lost your job, she said. Sure, I agreed cautiously. Even though my business was already bringing in about $3,000 in a week, I transferred $1,000 and from my business account to our joint checking account. Judy seemed surprised but pleased. It felt good to contribute again. Even though I hadn't been out of work long, I decided to meet with Mr. Lewis to discuss the future of the business. He reassured me that more complex machines were on the way, meaning plenty of work ahead. Relieved, I knew I could relax a bit. On a warm day, Cindy stopped by as usual. She greeted me with a smile. Hey, handsome, where have you been? Come on over and I'll tell you, I replied. Content with how things were unfolding as Cindy joined me, I couldn't resist sharing some news with a hint of pride. You're now speaking to the president of Precise Word Services, Inc., Jacob R. Fouts, she laughed off my announcement. Yeah, right, the president, sure, Jake. We shared a lighthearted moment before she remarked, It's good to see you happy. It's been a while. Acknowledging her observation, I admitted, Yeah, it feels like a weight's been lifted. I can move forward again, her curiosity peaked. She asked, how does Judy feel about it? I met her gaze and confessed, 
She doesn't really know Cindy Singh puzzled. You mean she can't decide? No, I clarified. I haven't told her how well the business is doing, she paused briefly before responding. Oh, I then reminded her, Cindy, remember when you asked if Judy and I were really happy? She nodded. Yeah, reflecting on our situation I confided, I'm not so sure anymore. I haven't lied to her, but I haven't told her everything either. Why not? She pressed. I shrugged, uneasy. I don't know, I just had this feeling something's off. After a thoughtful pause, I posed a hypothetical question. If you were in my place making good money, would you tell Al? Cindy considered my question, then replied, Jake, that's a tough question. We live on Al's commissions, and it's hard sometimes. I'd hate to think he'd hold out on me, I expressed my concern. Yeah, that's what's bothering me. I'm holding out on Judy and I'm not sure why, Cindy responded matter-of-factly. That's easy, you don't trust her, I asked, seeking affirmation. You think she was confident in her observation. I know, I can tell something's wrong between you two and I'm pretty sure it's not you, curious, I asked. Why you say that, Cindy was frank. I know you, Jake, you're straightforward, no nonsense. I've noticed how Judy treats you when she thinks no one is watching. She acts like she married beneath her. I don't know why, but that's what I see, I murmured thoughtfully. Her parents, Cindy inquired. What about them, I explained. They don't think much of me, maybe it's rubbing off on her, Cindy scoffed. Are her parents royalty or something? No, I clarified. Her dad's a city employee and her mom works part-time at a market, definitely not royalty frustrated, Cindy advised. Then they should be grateful she married someone who treats her well. You deserve better, I sighed, pondering. Maybe they had higher expectations for her, as Cindy leaned back, she asked. So, what now, I confessed. I don't know, I still love her, but it feels like she's given up on me. I hope I'm wrong, Cindy responded softly. I hope so too, Jake. Though there were no signs Judy was having an affair, I began to worry. A few weeks later, she mentioned working overtime due to a reorganization at the lab. We seemed to be drifting apart, which made me sad. I was nearing 28, and we hadn't started a family. I wondered if we ever would I cut back on night work to spend more time with Judy, hoping to reconnect. I also began contributing $800 and to $1,000 in a week to our joint account, explaining that the business was now stable. Despite our improved finances, our relationship remained distant. We made love only once or twice a week, and no amount of effort on my part could change that. Meanwhile, my business with Mr. Lewis was thriving. He regularly praised my work, and as I became more efficient, I found time for myself. Occasionally, I'd take a break to enjoy a lunch out or a beer at the local bar after our intense conversation weeks earlier. Cindy and I didn't see each other much until I started inviting her over for morning coffee. It became our daily time to talk openly, without worrying about being overheard. One day Cindy asked, How's Judy? Same, distant, I replied. Do you think you two will make it? I want to keep trying, but I'm not sure, I admitted. Both of you need to try for it to work, she said. Yeah, I know. Then she paused and said, Jake, she's cheating on you. I froze. Cindy would never joke about something like that. You know this? I asked quietly. Yeah, I know. With who? I asked, my voice shaking. Her boss, Turnbull. How long? I asked, feeling cold inside. Not long with him, but he's not the first. What? Who else? I found out Al slept with her a few months ago. Holy crap. Anyone else? I don't know, but one's enough, isn't it? Yeah, more than enough, I said. I'm going to kick Al out. I'm done with him. He's done this before, and if I let it slide, he'll do it again. I'm looking for a job before I leave him. I won't let my kids live in poverty. Jesus, Cindy, can this get any worse? I groaned. I remember you asking me something similar when you lost your job, and Judy gave you hell for it, she reminded me. What a mess, I said, feeling utterly frustrated. Yeah, she agreed. Well, I guess I'll be rethinking my financial plans. No way am I giving Judy anything after this. She can go live with her boss. Can't blame you just don't do anything that'll land you in jail. 
I need you for my morning coffee, she joked, trying to lighten the mood. Maybe we should both kick them out and move in together. I said, half joking. You're forgetting something, Jake. The kids. No, I'm not. If they don't come with us, the deal's off, I joked back, trying to lift the heaviness of the moment. Cindy laughed, but I noticed tears in her eyes. We both needed a release from the heaviness of the situation, so we shared a laugh. It felt good to have someone to talk to. We decided to set aside our spouse problems for the day. I had work to finish and I needed to figure out how to cope with living with Judy until I decided what to do. Surprisingly, I felt emotionally detached, more disappointed than angry. I even wondered how many others there had been besides Al and her boss. That evening I acted as if nothing had changed, though it took me longer than usual to fall asleep. I kept thinking about what to do and realized I needed proof. Not that I doubted Cindy, but I wanted to see it myself. The next morning, Judy claimed she had to work late again, which I suspected meant she was seeing her boss. I called Cindy, borrowed her car and staked out the clinic parking lot. Sure enough, Judy came out with a tall man in a nice suit. They got a new Mercedes and I followed them to a hotel. I watched them check in each carrying a small overnight bag. I took several pictures, confirming what I needed to know. I returned Cindy's car and told her what I saw. She hugged me and advised me to cool down and think before confronting Judy. We agreed to talk more the next day. The next morning, Cindy and I had time to discuss our next steps before the kids got home. I was angry and hurt by Judy's betrayal, but knew the marriage was over. There was no doubt about that. I asked Cindy how she found out. She explained that gossip spread through mutual acquaintances. One of Judy's co-workers noticed the affair with her boss, and it eventually reached Cindy through a chain of people who knew we were neighbors. Cindy added that many people were aware of Judy's affair. When I asked how she found out about Al and Judy, Cindy said it was through a nosy neighbor who noticed Al visiting my house when I was away. I guess Judy fell for his talk about being a big deal at work, Cindy said, shaking her head. Cindy then asked if Judy's boss, Turnbull, was married. I confirmed he was, but I didn't know much else. Cindy grabbed my phone book, looked up his number, and called. Hello? Is this Mrs. Richard Turnbull? Cindy asked. After a brief silence, she apologized, pretending she had the wrong number, and hung up, giving me a knowing smile. He's married and they don't have any kids, Cindy confirmed. I shook my head, realizing how sharp she was. No wonder I could never fool her. We sat quietly for a bit. I think we should visit City Hall, Jake. I'd like to see who owns the clinic property, she suggested. What's on your mind? I asked. You might find some leverage. A title search can reveal interesting things. Let's go if you have the time. All the time in the world I smiled. Ten minutes and ten dollars later, we discovered that the clinic's property title was under Mrs. Diane Turnbull's name, matching the home address of Robert Turnbull. Looks like Mrs. Turnbull has the upper hand, Cindy said with a smirk. So lover boy's wife owns the building, and maybe he's just the manager, I guessed. Exactly. I'll bet Judy doesn't know that. If he's playing her, she's in for a rude awakening when I dump her, I replied. Ain't that a shame? Cindy chuckled. We left City Hall and grabbed lunch together. Being with Cindy always lifted my spirits. We avoided discussing our personal issues until we were back at the townhouse. So, what's next? I wondered aloud. Did you take the pictures I suggested? Cindy asked. Yeah, I said pulling out my camera and connecting it to my computer. We looked through the photos. These shots at the hotel desk and elevator don't leave much doubt. You could hire a private detective for more evidence, but it probably isn't worth it. Whether you divorce her for infidelity or irreconcilable differences, the outcome will be the same. Save your money and brace for the worst, Cindy advised. I never thought it would come to this, I said, shaking my head. No one ever does. 
I didn't think Al would cheat on me, but he did, more than once. I'm just stuck for now, needing a job before I can leave him and provide for the kids, Cindy said. I've been thinking about something, I started cautiously. Hear me out with an open mind. I'll try, she replied, focusing on my words. The other day I joked about us moving in together with the kids, but the more I think about it, the more I like the idea. My income will exceed $125,000 and this year. I'm doing well with work, and I could buy a four-bedroom house in the same school district. You and the kids could move in as tenants until you find a job you like. No strings attached, I proposed. That's a sweet offer, Jake, but it wouldn't be fair to you. What about your personal life and future? You don't want to stay single forever, do you? She asked. No, but this doesn't have to be permanent. If you find a job and want to move out, you can. At least you'd be in a stable environment with the kids, I explained. Jake, you're a great guy, but what if I move out? What will you do with a big house then? She asked, concerned. I shrugged. Maybe you won't want to move out, I said, almost cringing. Cindy's eyes widened. Are you saying you have feelings for me? I nodded. Sorry, but yeah. Oh, Jake, don't do this to me, she said, clearly conflicted. Do what? I asked with a slight smile. Don't mess with my head. This is too much. I haven't even kicked Al out yet, and now you're coming on to me. It's not fair, she said, frustrated. I know, but what they did to us wasn't fair either. This isn't about fairness. It's about what we both know. If you don't feel the same, just say so, I replied. Cindy sat quietly, tears forming in her eyes. She got up, wandered around the kitchen and living room, shaking her head and mumbling to herself. I took it as a good sign. She hadn't said no or gotten angry. She was uncertain, but not offended. Damn you, Jake, Cindy finally said, walking toward me. How could you? Then, without another word, she wrapped her arms around me, pulling me into a tight embrace. When she let go, I stood up and hugged her back. Can I take that as a yes then? I asked. Of course. How could I say no to you? She replied, wiping away tears but smiling. No strings, Cindy. If it works, great. If not, no pressure, I reassured her. She looked into my eyes and said, I'll make sure it works, then started crying again. I felt hopeful that we could get through the tough times ahead and come out better on the other side. Following Don Simmons' advice, I hired a family law firm and retained Marta Kinsey a sharp lawyer dedicated to protecting my interests. I decided not to hide my new income during the divorce. I'd disclose everything if necessary, but negotiate to avoid alimony. Marta suggested a bluff, proposing we offer Judy a split of current assets and no alimony, hoping she'd accept without knowing about my new business. I told Marta I'd serve Judy the papers soon and she prepared the documents. The next week passed without incident, though Judy had two more overtime sessions. Marta called to confirm everything was ready, so I called Cindy. It's D-Day, Cindy. I have the papers and need to figure out how to deliver them. Wanna come over? Sure, I'll be right there. Get the coffee ready. We chatted over coffee before I laid out my plan. Tonight, I'll confront Judy tell her I know about Turnbull and give her the divorce papers. If she resists, I'll show her the photos and mention witnesses. I'll also remind her that Mrs. Turnbull doesn't know about the affair, which could push her to agree. If things get ugly, I'll move out and we can fight it out legally. Have you packed a bag? Cindy asked. Not yet, but I will before she gets home. No overtime tonight, I said with a smirk. Cindy kissed me lightly and hugged me. Good luck. Tell me how it goes. Once this is over, we'll figure out how to handle Al, which will be tougher. We knew Al wouldn't take things quietly, so Cindy planned to stay in their townhouse until things settled down. I even loaned her enough for Marta's retainer, and we decided to tackle our situations together.
That evening, after our usual dinner routine, I told Judy we needed to talk. She tensed up, probably expecting another we're not close conversation. Enough talk, Judy. I know about your affair with Robert Turnbull. Since you don't respect me or our marriage, I'm divorcing you. Here are the papers, I said calmly, surprised by how composed I felt. Her shocked expression was priceless. She gasped for air, coughing and struggling to respond. How? Was all she could manage. You weren't discreet. Plenty of people, including your co-workers, knew about the affair. Oh, God. I'm sorry, Jake. I wish I could say something. I'm so sorry. I shrugged. I'm proposing a 50 to 50th split. We can sell the townhouse and split the equity, or you can buy me out. I won't be living here again. I remain calm and clear-headed. Judy nodded, saying, that's fair, though she couldn't look at me. I couldn't resist asking why she hadn't spoken up sooner. I thought she might offer an excuse, but she didn't. I thought Robert would give me a better life. He's successful, and I believed he could offer more than you could. I considered bursting her bubble, but remembered Marta's advice. Don't overplay your hand. Instead I said, I hope you find happiness. Clearly you weren't happy with me. It wasn't you, Jake. You were always good to me, I just wanted more out of life than you could give, she admitted. An upgrade, I muttered. Maybe. Robert is wealthy and I thought he'd provide a good life after his divorce. He's married? I feigned surprise. Judy nodded, looking ashamed. I'm not proud of it. We cheated, but we were good together. Her voice trailed off. I'm moving out, Judy? I'll stay in a motel until I find a place. If you agree to the settlement, the papers are here. You might want to consult a lawyer, I said, hoping she'd accept the offer. No, I won't fight it. I hurt you, and I'm to blame. Fifty to fiftieth is fair. I'll sign the papers tonight, she said, still avoiding eye contact. When I referred with my bag, she seemed surprised that I was already packed, but said nothing. She handed me the signed papers and I checked them before putting them in my pocket. I'll come by tomorrow to get the rest of my things and my computer files, I told her. Of course. This is still your house, Jake, she finally looked at me, her sadness almost making me reconsider. I kissed her cheek and said goodbye, Judy. Then quietly left. I had won my freedom, but lost what I had once hoped for. It felt like a hollow victory, but I knew I couldn't stay with her after what she'd done. At the motel, I called Marta the next morning and told her how things went. She was pleased. No drama. Just a quiet end to my marriage. I thanked her and hung up. I dropped off the papers on my way to the house, realizing it no longer felt like home. I gathered my clothes and personal items, leaving behind anything else. Judy could keep the photos and we'd split the furniture later. In my office I reflected on the end of an eight-year chapter of my life. Though I didn't feel great about it, I knew I had to move on. Thinking of Cindy lifted my spirits. I started downloading my files to my new laptop, a task that would take most of the morning. I informed Mr. Lewis that I needed a week off due to personal issues, and he was understanding. I promised to catch up the following week. Working from the motel wouldn't be ideal, but it was manageable. I missed my morning coffee with Cindy, but we were being cautious until she served Al with divorce papers. We met at an espresso shack on Friday and parked in a quiet lot to talk. How are you holding up? I asked. Okay. I'm not looking forward to telling Al. I'll do it in the morning after the kids go to school. It's the only time we're alone, Cindy replied. Mata advised me not to insist he leave if there's no other place for him to sleep but I'm not sharing a bed with him any longer than necessary. What about the kids? When will you tell them assuming Al will be gone when they get home? I'll tell them then, Cindy said. Do you think they can handle it? I asked. Annie will be okay, but I found out something that seals it for Al, Cindy said, pausing to sip her latte. 
Annie got into an argument with a classmate, and the girl said her dad was a regular visitor at her friend's mom's house. The mom's name is Mimi Tremont, a divorcee. Annie got upset but the girl stood her ground and even told Annie to ask the mom if she didn't believe it. Cindy looked defeated, a side of her I hadn't seen before. How's Annie handling it? I asked. I calmed her down and told her not to believe everything but I think she knows. She's only ten, but kids grow up fast. I'm sorry, Cindy, it's hard on them. Telling the kids that I'm leaving their father won't be easy. They'll still see him, but it's going to hurt. I nodded, knowing Cindy didn't want to deny Al visitation. After pause, Cindy added, they asked about you, you know. Really? I'm surprised. They like you a lot. Having you around will help them adjust. You're more like a dad than anyone else. Thanks, I'm looking forward to that and being with you, I said. She reached for my hand. You said you wanted to talk. What's on your mind? I want you to come with me to see a house I'm thinking of buying. I'd like your opinion since you'll be living there too. Sure, let's do it. I could use the distraction, she agreed with a weak smile. At 11 um, we met the real estate agent at the house. I showed Cindy the rooms and pointed out areas needing work. It wasn't a luxury home, but it had enough space, private bedrooms, two and a half bathrooms and a basement for storage or a playroom. I like it, Cindy said. It needs some work, but nothing we can't handle. Plenty of space for the kids and the basement could be their playroom. If you're looking for my approval, you've got it. Great, let's make an offer and see what happens. It's been on the market for four months so we might get a good deal. We told the agent we were ready to make an offer, and he was thrilled, likely due to the slow market. I made a low offer expecting a counter, hoping to gauge how desperate the sellers were. The empty house suggested they might be carrying two mortgages. Afterward, Cindy offered to buy lunch, so we stopped at a sushi bar. She joked that Al would never eat there and I laughed, glad to see her humor returning, though I knew it might be temporary until she faced Al. The weekend at the motel was lonely. Judy was out of my life, and even though we weren't close, it was still someone to talk to. Now I was alone and I couldn't see Cindy either. On Saturday, I took a walk by the river for a break and spent the rest of the weekend catching up on work. By Sunday afternoon I was back on track and Mr. Lewis was pleased when I updated him on Monday. He mentioned a special project he wanted me to take on so we arranged to meet on Tuesday. I also called Cindy who had heard from Marta that all the divorce paperwork was ready. Cindy was nervous about telling Al and wanted to discuss her strategy. I suggested it might be better to have someone serve Al with the papers instead. Cindy was adamant. No way. If someone else serves him he'll go ballistic. I need to do this myself. Maybe I can make him understand how much he's hurt me and the kids. I'm not changing my mind or forgiving him. He brought this on himself and I'm ending it. I let him off before and it just let him walk all over me again. Fool me once, that's it. I wish I could be there to help, I said, knowing she appreciated the thought but also that it wasn't possible. I'm doing it tomorrow morning. I probably won't sleep thinking about it, but I can't let the kids see this. I have to face him myself. It's the only way, she said firmly. Good luck, I offered. Tuesday morning I followed my usual routine gathered my laptop and treated myself to a full breakfast at the motel restaurant. I laughed at still being frugal despite my improved finances. After breakfast I waited until rush hour passed before heading to Mr. Lewis's office. I couldn't stop thinking about how Cindy was handling Al. She was strong, but I knew this was tough for her. At my meeting with Mr. Lewis, he surprised me by proposing a huge project translating manuals for tractors, backhoes, and forklifts from China. The scope was far beyond anything I'd done before. I'm not sure I can handle this alone, I admit it. It's a big project and I'm not an expert on this equipment. Mr. Jake, you are very good at what you do. Can you find people to help? I'll pay $100 in an hour. 
This is a big job, and I trust you to do it right, he urged. He was clearly relying on me, so I agreed to consider it. Let me review one of the manuals and see if I can make it work. Thank you, Mr. Jake. I trust you, he said gratefully. I left with a forklift manual in hand, feeling a mix of excitement and apprehension. As I drove, I thought of Cindy and felt a chill. I grabbed my phone but hesitated to call. What if Al was still there? If things had gone wrong? I decided to wait until I reached her place. I arrived at Cindy's townhouse around 10.30 and noticed Al's car wasn't there. I called her and she answered softly. Hello? Cindy, it's Jake. Are you okay? I asked, concerned. Yeah, I'm okay, she replied. Can I come over? I'd like to see you. I'm right outside your door, she said, just making sure Al's gone. He is, I assured her. Come in, the coffee's ready. A moment later I walked in to find Cindy at the kitchen table, looking exhausted, her eyes red from crying. Hi, I greeted her, sitting down beside her with a cup of coffee. What happened? I asked gently. She sighed, shaking her head. He completely broke down, Jake crying, begging on his knees for another chance. It was so pathetic, it made me cry too. Did he agree to leave? I asked. Yes, though he tried to deny everything at first. When I mentioned Judy and why you're divorcing her, he looked like he was going to be sick. Then I brought up Mimi Tremont and what the girl at school said to Annie. And that's when he lost it. That sounds rough. How are you holding up? Not great, Jake. Like you, I feel like I wasted years. Ten years I can't get back. Part of me is angry. Part of me is sad. There's a big difference between your ten years and my seven, I said. Oh yeah, like what? Like Annabeth and Bradley. Tears welled up in her eyes as I took her hands and gently squeezed them. Hold on, Cindy. You'll get through this. Cindy finally broke down, and I held her, letting her release all the pain. She was strong, and I knew she'd come out of this okay, even if it would hurt for a while. Tell me what happened, I urged. She composed herself enough to explain. She had Al sit in the kitchen while she told him she was filing for divorce. He tried to talk his way out of it, but Cindy was too prepared for that. When he realized he couldn't convince her otherwise, he played the sympathy card, bringing up the kids and their years together. But his act only made it easier for Cindy. His fake remorse didn't faze her, and she confronted him with all his betrayals, including the ones she had previously forgiven. By the end, Al was a mess. She had already packed a bag for him and told him to leave. He thought it was temporary until she handed him the divorce papers, making it clear he was gone for good. He left defeated, dragging his suitcase behind him. I wish I could have been there for you, Cindy, I said. No, Jake. I had to do this myself. It wasn't easy, but it was necessary. Don't blame yourself because I'm upset. It had to be done. And it had to be done firmly. Well, I guess we're both starting new lives now, I said. I'm just glad you'll be part of mine. She looked at me intently. Are you having second thoughts about us? Of course not. It's just... It's your choice, Cindy. Whatever happens, it's up to you. Jake, that's a cop-out. You tell me you have feelings for me, and then you leave it all to me. What kind of man are you? She challenged. I couldn't help but smile and she couldn't help but smile back. Then she wrapped her arms around my neck and kissed me deeply. I don't think we'll be apart anytime soon, she said. As expected, the offer on the house was countered. But it wasn't far from my ideal price. After a quick negotiation, the deal was done. I now owned a four-bedroom house in a nice neighborhood. I'm almost embarrassed by how easily I moved on from Judy. I've realized I never truly loved her, not the way my parents love each other. I've learned what real love feels like now, and it's different from what I had with Judy. Since signing the divorce papers, I haven't seen Judy. 
The final decree will come in February. Rumor has it she and Bobby left with little more than his Mercedes. His soon-to-be ex-wife is running the lab, and Judy seems to have lost her dreams twice. Al is still working at the Chevy dealership, but he's changed. His divorce from Cindy will be final in March. He visits the kids weekly but stays low-key otherwise. The single life doesn't seem to suit him as much as he thought it would. Cindy, at my suggestion, decided not to ask for alimony or child support. Al's down, and neither of us would find satisfaction in kicking him further. We're financially secure, while Al struggles with mortgage payments and credit card debt. Playing around has proven costly for him. Cindy and I are a completely different story. She doesn't take crap from anyone, including me, I'll never understand why Al cheated on her. He deserves the Dumbest Man Award. I love Cindy like crazy and would fight to keep her. When she says she loves me, I won't argue. I'm benefiting from her high opinion. I'm glad I stay in shape because I don't want to disappoint her. The fourth bedroom didn't stay a bedroom for long. After Cindy kicked Al out, she explained everything to the kids. Annie, aware of her dad's mistakes, took it better than Brad. But both needed reassurance they'd still see him. Brad was quiet for a few days, but eventually adjusted as kids do. Cindy told them about the new house, big backyard, and that they'd stay in the same school, which eased their concerns. When she mentioned I'd be living with them, Brad cheered and Annie nodded approval. They seem to feel the same way about me as I did about them, Cindy said. Kids pick up on adult vibes. We moved into the new house after Halloween. I took the kids trick-or-treating in their old neighborhood, and they enjoyed seeing familiar faces. No sign of Al, probably something he couldn't handle. I hired movers to make the transition smooth. Judy and I agreed on splitting furniture, and I avoided arguing over small facts. Al, now living with a work friend, didn't need furniture, so we took care of it, ensuring he got half its value. I only had to buy a TV for the kids and a few dining room items. With Christmas approaching, I'm excited. I plan to spoil Cindy and the kids, but carefully, to avoid too much heat from Cindy. She knows how much I care about them, and that's made our new life easier, along with the improved sex life. Cindy is far more passionate and uninhibited than what I was used to, and I'm doing just fine, thank you. To avoid disturbing the kids, I set up my office in the bedroom between theirs and ours. We've also embraced the benefits of working from home, turning happy hour into a midday affair. As for my career, I found a multilingual engineer perfect for Mr. Lewis's project. We secured a contract to produce manuals in English, French, and Spanish, as Mr. Lewis eyes the American market. I have years of work ahead, not just for him, but for others who have discovered my skills. I'll need to expand to meet the growing demand. Cindy is my personal assistant, excelling at negotiations, scheduling, and finances. She's truly my partner. And to top it off, we're getting married during spring break in Hawaii, with our families joining us. Cindy's mother, a widow, will be there too. She never liked Al, so I'm starting fresh with her. This time, it's for keeps.